welcome to In Conversation. Thank you. Should we be more afraid of North Korea's latest missile tests? I think we need to, to look at the, uh, the external and um, domestic uh, factors um, to explain North Korea's policy. Uh, domestically, uh, North Korea may feel the need to amplify outside threats uh, to justify to its people why the country must continue to invest in its uh, defense industry despite the deteriorating economic conditions and Kim Jong-un's repeated pledge to improve the people's livelihoods. Uh, externally, North Korea may feel the need to uh, project its power uh, lest it comes across as being weak after years of self-isolation and sanctions. Uh, I think also um, when you look at North Korea's foreign policy, how it has shifted um, in recent years, uh, we might have to think about um, possibly um, the, the changing uh, strategic value of the U.S. for Pyongyang. Let me come back to just what you said. The changing value of the U.S. to North Korea, what do you mean by that? Isn't that who Pyongyang is always looking at? I think that is the conventional wisdom, uh, but I think just given what Kim Jong-un has said last year about denuclearization um, and how that, that was so much more different than we had seen before. Uh, for example, he said no line of retreat has been, retreat has been drawn, we, would ne we will never denuclearize. Um, those words were much stronger than anything he had ever said before in public about denuclearization. And um, I think what we could be looking at is a fundamentally shifting um, U.S. policy um, in Pyongyang. So you're saying it's a much harder line that they're going toward? Much much harder line and what that su could suggest is that North, the U.S. may no longer be as important to Pyongyang as, as, as it was in the past. Who is so, more important then? Uh, well, um, I'm not sure if this is a near to midterm uh, uh, policy change, but we have certainly seen Pyongyang gravitating more uh, to chi China and Russia. Uh, China uh, starting in the summer of 2019. Uh, soon after the collapse of the Hanoi summit, and Russia more recently, um, right after Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Um, but the pivot uh, toward China and Russia aside, I think the more important thing here is the possibility, again, of uh, um, the, the change in strategic value um, of the U.S. for, uh, for Pyongyang's foreign policy. And, and if, that, if there is indeed a fundamental change, um, that would mean a huge change from uh, the U.S. policy that Pyongyang put in place uh, going back to the early 1990s. Um, and since that time, the U.S., as you had, as, as you indicated, has been the centerpiece of, um, of, Pyongyang's, North, of Pyongyang's foreign policy. Um, and, and, and that centerpiece has been that Pyongyang would normalize relations with the U.S., uh, by working for denuclearization. And again, going back to what Kim Jong-un said last year um, about denuclearization, I'm, I'm starting to wonder if there is a change in the way Pyongyang is looking at the U.S. But can we believe anything that comes out of an authoritarian regime like Pyongyang? After all, Trump and Kim Jong-un met in 2018 here in Singapore, and yet nothing came out of that that was concrete. Denuclearization did not take place. One might argue North Korea never intended to fully denuclearize. Uh, however, um, I think it is significant that um, North Korea is coming out and actually publicly saying it. That's that's different, I think. And and I think that could indicate a policy change. Uh, when you when you say that, well, can we believe anything that North Korea says? Uh, we have to look at the different levels of, of authoritativeness. Um, when Pyongyang says something, you know, there are higher level statements, there are lower level statements. These words were spoken by Kim Jong-un and these words were broadcast domestically, uh, leaving very little wiggle room for North Korea to change its course down the road. How does an analyst like you really know what's taking place? Even on the most banal level of, do you actually know how much their nuclear arsenal has grown? Um, how much nuclear arsenal has grown, it's hard to tell from uh, open, open sources. Uh, that will have to be done through other channels. Uh, but in terms of what we can glean, uh, 
about what's going on inside North Korea, uh, we can we can tell by uh, North Korea's media messaging, so propaganda messaging. Uh, obviously, I would say more than 95% of what North Korea says is propaganda, uh, so it's noise. But the remaining 5% or so is the real message, and I guess that is up to a good analyst to uh, to figure out what it is that they're trying to say. about power transition with Kim Jong-un showing off his young daughter at the missile test? Um, I think we have we don't have very we don't have a lot of data points to go off of when it comes to the daughter. Uh, I think her military appearances um, certainly were intended uh, to emphasize the message that the country needs to continue to develop nuclear and missile programs for the security of future generations. The security of future generations has been a constant theme that uh, that North Korean media played up um, with respect to Pasong 17, the ICBM. Uh, I think we have to give that a little more time and, and, and see before we jump into any conclusions. <clears throat> Her latest appearances, so the one at a sports contest between the cabinet and the military, and also her appearance at a construction site, were not military appearances. Uh, so all we can say at this point is that her the scope of her activities seems to be broadening. And again, what that means, it is hard to tell whether North Korea is laying the foundation for fourth generation hereditary successor um, or whether she herself is being groomed as a successor. I think only time will tell. But is it also about Kim Jong-un's ego? I think part of it is. Um, I would, I think North Korea is very rational, um, much more rational than we tend to think. Uh, but since you mentioned ego, I do think that the Hanoi summit, his failure to come to an agreement with the U.S. in Hanoi, has had a huge, profound impact on his psyche, uh, because because it was a failure, and. I can't imagine Kim Jong-un having been in situations where he failed in anything. I mean, he's a supreme leader. He was groomed as a prince. Um, so it must have been hard for him. And, you know, he had the lead, entire leadership to account for uh, when he went back home. You know, he lost face. Um, so I think after the Hanoi summit, we saw North Korea's policy on all fronts, economic, political, social, cultural, foreign, military, um, taking a harder line. And all of these policies across the board, domestic and foreign, have become a harder line um, in recent years. And I think the latest example you see is a party plenary meeting in December 2022, uh, where all of the policies became much harder line than, than before. shortage in North Korea has been going on for some time. Has it got worse now? So according to North Korean state media reporting, uh, it does seem to be, uh, this, the economic situation does seem to be uh, very challenged. It seems to be um, very difficult and it seems to have deteriorated in recent years. It's just because of the words that they have used that they did not use in the past. 
for example, uh, last year they used the formulation food crisis, um, and it came from the highest levels, um, Kim Jong included. Um, that said, though, I do think that uh, we need to remember that North Korea um, is resilient. Uh, it is a country that overcame the famine in the 1990s. Um, in more recent years, um, years of international sanctions and um, self-isolation. Uh, if you look at North Korean state media reporting now, uh, they continue to talk about economic self-sufficiency. They continue to talk about the dangers of receiving foreign aid. And that suggests to me that the economic situation is difficult, yes, but perhaps as, not as dire as, as we think or as outside reporting indicates. Well, that, that's what puzzles me because Surely when they say these words, food crisis, and that there is a problem, they talk about a reform of agriculture, these are all signals that they want something, isn't it? And isn't what they want aid? No, I don't think so um, in this case, because uh, those formulations are really intended um, to, you know, formulations like food crisis, um, difficult situation, all of those formulations are really more targeted in this case, uh, the domestic audience. So it's their way of telling the people, look, the situation is harsh. Uh, we need to we need to ramp it up and we need to produce more. Um, that's what it is. Um, if North Korea really wanted outside assistance, um, then there are ways that they have done that in the past. For example, they would use uh, their um, externally oriented media outlets. So what I mean by that is um, media outlets that are not available for access. Um, it, from within the country, so by the average people. So these are websites and um, you know news agencies that um, are available only for outside consumption. Um, you know, the, the North Korea use has used these websites um, in the past, news outlets in the past, to indicate that they would like um, foreign assistance. What about civil unrest? Would Pyongyang? They've been able to quell everything, but would they be afraid of any civil unrest if the conditions get even worse? I think there's always fear of that, um, but I, I think that they have a good system in place um, for um, you know surveilling one another. You know they have cells everywhere within um, throughout the country, um, a reporting system, surveillance system, um, but still, one could say that um, if the situation deteriorates further. Um, you know, there could be that um, fear on the part of the leadership. But again, this goes back to my point about how um, the situation may not be as dire as we think, just because they continue to push back on foreign aid. China is by far the largest trading partner of North Korea and has tremendous political influence in Pyongyang. Why isn't China doing anything about these increasing missile tests? Uh, the intensifying U.S.-China competition, uh, the rift between the U.S. and Russia um, are actually um, helping um, Pyongyang accelerate its weapons program. Uh, Russia and China have little to no reason uh, to pressure Pyongyang to uh, suspend its nuclear development and return to the negotiating table. Um, at the moment, they have little to no reason for that. Um, and I think we saw this playing out last week, even um, at the UN um, Security Council, when uh, uh, they could not um, adopt a presidential statement due to China and Russia vetoing it. So is the real winner all in all of this Russian President Vladimir Putin? Um, I think at least for the short term, um, it will be a beneficial um, relationship. Um, certainly Pyongyang um, has an extra, la extra layer of political cover um, in the UN Security Council in addition to China. So if China becomes you know, a little bit more neutral, um, then, then it will have Russia's um, 
backing. Um, so there's a political cover um, in the UN Security Council. Um, economically, financially, uh, we have seen various reports um, about uh, North Korea exporting um, shells uh, to Russia, um, North Korea exporting military uniforms to Russia, uh, possibly even um, eyeing the possibility of sending laborers um, to Russia um, and the breakaway regions in Ukraine. Um, so I would say that, and, and, and for Russia, you know, it has very few friends in the world right now. Um, and one extra friend certainly does help. If you could put your old CIA hat on, what sort of advice would you be giving to people in the U.S. government? Unfortunately, I don't think um, there is much that um, we can do other than a dramatic reversal of policy. Um, and what I mean by that is, at least for the near term, uh, North Korea will not return to the negotiating table. It will use the international political climate, the current climate, uh, to make progress on its five-year defense development plan that it presented in um, the Eighth Party Congress in January 2021. And again, the international political climate is very highly conducive to that, um, to helping um, Pyongyang with that. Um, and unless the U.S. does a complete reversal or near complete reversal um, of its North Korea policy, so no more joint military exercises with the U.S. with with South Korea, uh, removing its nuclear umbrella from Japan and South Korea, um, removing sanctions. Um, That's I, not going to happen. I don't, which, which is not going to happen. And that goes back to, back to my point about how um, there's probably very little that we can do um, for the time being. But I think what will happen is Pyongyang, again, will strive to make as much progress as it can on the five-year defense development plan that it mentioned in January 2021. Um, so making it, quote, unquote, nuclear status as irreversible as possible and return to the negotiating table and try to make the negotiations about arms control between North and South Korea, rather than North Korea's one-sided denuclearization. And again, the other thing to remember is that what, what Pyongyang sees, what Kim Jong-un sees from his, from his office in Pyongyang, in Pyongyang is, uh, is waning U.S. leadership, waning U.S. power on the global stage. Uh, and I think that is also playing into his strategic calculations. So Tokyo and Seoul are right to be really worried? I think so. Uh, I, I don't live in Seoul at the moment, but uh, I am certainly worried um, about where the situation is going to go. And um, given, again, North Korea's policy about responding to power with power, nuclear force with nuclear force, um, I think we will continue to see an escalation um, this year as well. So what is all of this leading to? Uh, I think... In the near term, it is uh, we're looking at um, military escalation, something similar to uh, the fall of 2022. Um, I think that North Korea may not respond to every single U.S. South Korea military exercise as it did in the fall of 2022, um, because um, a foreign ministry um, announcement um, in early February um, indicated that they may not uh, respond um, every single time. Um, but again, I think that also could mean um, fewer responses, but maybe bigger responses. So maybe less shorter range missile tests, but um, fewer bigger um, military activities, um, such as a reconnaissance uh, satellite launch. Um, and again, in the medium to longer term, I think we will continue to see North Korea ramping up on its military capabilities. So weapons programs, um, and and that is um, with a view to the longer term goal, which is um, arms control. What if we say that because every time Pyongyang does this, the rest of the world responds with horror and and uh, you know consternation. What about not responding to them and not feeding the attention? You know, I think this gets back to the. Uh, basic question of whether North Korea is doing this for international international attention. I don't think it is. I think sometimes it is, but it's not always about the U.S. and it's not always about international attention. Sure, when they do something 
they do that with their with with the knowledge that um, that North, that the rest of the world will know about its um, activities and what it's doing. But I don't think it's all about international attention. Um, and I know that that's um, the go-to answer when North Korea does something with an ICBM test. Oh, you know, the U.S. is so um, tied up with the situation in Ukraine that, you know, the, that North Korea is uh, on the back burner. You know, Pyongyang wants U.S. attention. Um, a lot of times they actually act on their own timetable. Uh, and I think maybe um, instead of um, ascribing all of Pyongyang's actions to the U.S., we also, again, need to think about the domestic and external context in which North Korea operates. Rachel Minyoon Lee, thank you very much for being on In Conversation. Thank you so much for having me on the show.